Hey everyone, Raif Darazi here, and today I'm excited to have a conversation with our esteemed guest, Dr. Gary Blick, to discuss his life's work in helping people in LGBTQ plus and HIV advocacy, clinical medicine, and how we can better equip ourselves to live long term with HIV. Throughout his storied career, Dr. Gary Blick has served as an HIV AIDS clinician, clinical researcher, lecturer and humanitarian. While in medical school at the University of Miami in the early 1980s, he was inspired to become an infectious disease specialist due to the burgeoning national HIV crisis. He completed his residency training at Yale University and Greenwich Hospital Association and went on to receive additional credentialing from the American Academy of HIV Medicine. He's been treating individuals and entire communities around the world for over 30 years. In addition to being the chief medical officer here at Healthcare Advocates International, he also co-founded HIV Advocates and founded the Zimbabwe AIDS Project, which he established following the successful treatment of an HIV positive Zimbabwean couple who gave birth to an HIV negative child in 2002. Years before, might we add, prevention of mother to child transmission became the standard of care throughout the world. Dr. Gary Blick, thank you so much for taking the time to join me for this interview today. How are you? Thanks, Rave. It's great to be here. I'm doing very well. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so just to tie it all together, Thomas Evans from your organization was kind enough to invite Bo, my boyfriend, and I to the Elton John AIDS Foundation Academy Viewing Gala earlier this month, which is all which is also a moment for fundraising. And this year, Elton John AIDS Foundation raised well over $10 million, a record record year for them. So that's amazing. Outstanding. Absolutely amazing. And so that's where I got to meet Gary, and I thought, what a great opportunity to bring him on the channel and share with you all, you know, what he's been doing for our community for and here and abroad for so many years. And um, Thomas originally reached out to be part of the Stigma Warriors campaign. Uh, let's start there. What's what inspired the campaign, and what is your goal with that? I guess just to talk about that, just a little bit of my background is, you know, I was raised uh, pretty much to be a humanitarian and to always give back. It's just what was inbred in me from my parents raising me. And so our Stigma Warrior campaigns is really an extension of me and the organization really helping not only the LGBT community, but also the HIV positive community and those that are HIV positive and don't know it yet. And as well as those that are HIV negative who should be on PrEP. The whole idea is we're trying to end global HIV by the year 2030, sort of the, the UN AIDS mission. Um, and to do that, we've obviously got to get people tested for HIV, recognize their infection, get them on medications, get them undetectable where they don't transmit it, and recognize also those who are HIV negative, get them on PrEP so they don't acquire HIV. You put all those things together, and now you're talking about really what our Stigma Warriors campaign is all about and what our inevitable goal is. Okay, so, and, th and thank you, by the way, for including me in the campaign, I'm honored. Pulling out a little bit, um, what is your personal assessment of the global and or domestic HIV AIDS epidemic? Yeah, so, so listen, no doubt about it. I've come through the pre-AZT years all the way through now. It's 37 years they've been treating. So we've come a long way. There's no doubt about that. Let's acknowledge that. We're down to like one pill a day to treat people with HIV infection or even a set of two shots once every eight weeks. That's phenomenal, right? The problem is people recognizing that they may be at risk so they get tested. The problem is recognizing you may be at risk so if you're negative, you get on PrEP. And that's why today, in 20, at least through 2023, we still have 37,000 people every year becoming HIV infected. And Rafe, that is despite having PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent people from getting HIV, being on the market for now 12 years. That is just completely unacceptable. And when you narrow that down of the 37,000 people, still 70% of those people are members of our LGBT community. And the majority of them are between 14 and 29 years old, our youth, especially from our inner city brown and black communities that are part of the LGBT community that are getting infected. This is just not an acceptable situation. And the idea of Sigma Warriors is to try to now make a dent in that and reduce those infection rates. But to do that, we've got to get the word out there. We need young influencers like yourself to help get us the word out there. We've got to get to these inner city brown and black kids to get the message to them, to let them know HIV is not a death sentence anymore. Get tested. 
If you get tested and get on medication and you get your virus undetectable where we can't measure it in your bloodstream, you'll never have to worry about transmitting it, even if you don't wear a condom to any of your HIV negative partners. Isn't that a refreshing thing to know that you wouldn't infect anybody if you had it? The key is you have to recognize that you're at risk to get it in the first place and then get tested. And if you have HIV negative, then of course you'll still be at risk if you're not in a single monog in a in a coupled monogamous relationship, you're still at risk. Then you can get on pre-exposure pro prevention, prophylaxis. That will prevent you from acquiring HIV. And that's almost hundred percent effective. It sounds easy, but but we have not made any progress now in 12 years. And that's and might I add, even even for those in a relation monogamous relationship, there I mean, that's how I found out I had AIDS. I was in a three and a half year monogamous, well, I thought was monogamous relationship. And um, yeah, then it, all of a sudden I had this thing that I thought was not even possible for me at that time. Yeah, yeah. Rafe, we call that like self-identified risk. And, and, and you know, there's so much misconception out there. There's so much misinformation out there. Yeah, I just had a, a, a young, a, I shouldn't say a young man, he's younger than me, he's 62, come in, married relationship, 20 years, um, with the same partner for eight years before that. His partner died from cancer about a year ago, and nobody ever tested him for HIV. Like, think about that. He came into my office with undetectable T cells, less than 20 T cells, and, and nobody had ever tested him. So that's the healthcare system saying, oh, you must be in a married relationship. You're not at risk. He's a gay man. Okay, what about his past? What about the things he did prior to the relationship? You know, and, and whoever asked them maybe what they were doing inside the relationship, if they had others in the relationship, and if they really were monogamous at that point. The bottom line is, you know, he came in, he got tested, he got diagnosed. We really saved him because he had no T cells. He had a 1.8 million viral load, tremendously high. He was at risk from getting an AIDS-related infection and potentially dying from that in 2024. That should never be, but yeah, you're right. That's incredible. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah and right. and I love what the UK is doing with their opt out HIV testing because that that removes any of this screening effort. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rafe, you know we you know maybe me being you know you know an expert in sexually transmitted infections and HIV, we don't care who you are, what you are, what you do. It doesn't matter your age, your race, your gender, anything. We test everybody. So here it's an opt in because you're coming here knowing that that's what we do. And yes, you can opt out from doing that testing if you'd like. But the bottom line is nobody opts out. If you've never been tested, you get tested that one time to know where you are here in this day and age. And, and that goes a long way. That's how we pick up a lot of the infections. We do the same okay. with sexually transmitted yeah. infections. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do. We test everybody for all sexual Why transmitted not? infections, right? And unlike many providers where they just have you pee in a cup, you know, looking for like, you know, urinary gonorrhea, chlamydia, you know, we test the throat, we test the rectum, we test the urine, we do all three sources. The majority of infections like that, gonorrhea and chlamydia, are found in the throat and in the rectum, not in the urine. And, and if you just do like one third testing, you're going to miss the majority of those diagnoses, which is why we have a, sec a syphilis epidemic right now as we speak, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that data point. That's really interesting. Um, okay. So for folks who aren't familiar, can you tell us a little bit more about Healthcare Advocates International and what is yeah. your mission? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, we're a nonprofit. I, I entered the nonprofit world probably in the year 2010. Uh, actually, I entered probably a nonprofit world first in the year 2000 in a failed attempt to open up a clinic in Africa at that point. Uh, we were about to open up in Botswana in October 12th of 2001. And unfortunately, 9-11 happened the month right before. So the ability to fundraise and the ability to fly over there with low insurance rates just went out the window. And my first attempt to open up a clinic in, uh, in, in Africa sort of ended at that point. Um, our Surgeon General at the time, I don't know if you, you, you remember this man, but his name was Surgeon General C. Everett Coop. Uh, and, and he was a brilliant, brilliant man. He had this big burly beard, you know, was in his, you know, uh, uh, a captain's outfit uniform and everything. And he was our ambassador at large at that time. And his name was Chip for C. Everett Coop, Chick Coop. He used to call him Chicken Coop. Chick told me, he said, listen, you're on the right path. Just keep your eyes and ears open. Even though you can't open now, the time will come to be able to do that. And so I'd gone back to Africa before 2010 and said, maybe this felt right to, to do this, that medication that you mentioned that we were sending to that HIV positive couple, um, the 
the boy who was born out of preventing mother to child transmission is my godson. And they, they named him after me. So his first name in the Shona language in Zimbabwe is Tichona, which in Shona means we'll see. Because nobody knew at that point we could prevent mother to child's man transmission. And so his name is really we'll see. And it's sure enough, he turned out to be HIV negative. His middle name is Gary. So I went over for his birthday party in like 2008. I think it was his seven-year-old birthday party. And all these kids, all these orphans, his friends, you know, people, you know, kids who had lost their parents to HIV, all draw you into the party, all their faces painted with African game on it for the birthday party and felt right. It felt like this was the time to try it again. So I started my next nonprofit that was World Health Clinicians. And with that nonprofit, I was able to open up the, uh, the clinic in Zimbabwe at that point. But the mission has always been to reduce the stigma and discrimination associated with being members of not only the LGBT community, but the stigma and discrimination associated with being HIV positive, uh, being at risk for HIV. And, and, and that goes a huge way. That is still problems one, two, three, four, five in our list dealing with stigma and discrimination of being HIV positive, of being at risk for HIV, of being a member of the LGBT community. So that's what got me into the nonprofit world. And, and the new derivative of that is my latest uh, nonprofit, Healthcare Advocates International, where we're just continuing the work, but more globalizing it. And now with this work, we're going to focus in on really reducing that infection rate from 37,000 patients a year in the United States. And we're going to work with England too, where they have 5,000 patients infected every year with that. Sounds a very small amount, but but they've done a lot of work to reduce that number. And we'd love to be part of you know reducing that number further. All right. Awesome. And can you tell me a little bit about what being the chief medical officer means? What does that job entail? So, you know, I, I don't want to do the, the business part of it. So I have a, you know, executive director to do that. So I do all the medical of it, which also includes the campaigns and everything we do. So we have a wonderful, you know, um, uh, headquarters here in Stratford, Connecticut, where people come into this warm, safe, loving, really family-like environment. And, and I'm proud to have created that kind of environment because not only members of the LGBT community, but anybody really needs that. And in in certainly with healthcare the way it is these days, and it being the like 10 minutes in and out. We give people all the time they need. They should feel safe here. They should feel comfortable to tell us everything about themselves. And remember, a lot of this is sexual. So we have no problems questioning and talking about sexual activities and what people do to help them assess their risk, to teach them about acquiring and how to prevent HIV infections, sexually transmitted infections. So a chief medical officer does involve some of that administrative stuff, but it really is all the stuff that I love to do, which is medical treatment, the care and treatment, comprehensive care and treatment of the LGBT community, as well as the HIV positive community, and those that are at risk for, develop, for uh, uh, getting infected with sexually transmitted infections. So you yourself are working personally with patients one-on-one? -on -one. Oh, on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, I, I, constantly. And I love and it. And <laughs> do, you, do you find your approach to be any noticeably different when working with those living with HIV versus not? No, I, I, I'd say, you know, we treat everybody the same. You know, we don't hide things. We're very open and honest about everything. So so it may be a little bit overwhelming when you find that you're HIV positive. So so maybe on that first visit, we won't go through the other things that we found, which, you know, things like low testosterone. Uh, certainly during that first visit, if we find out you've got, you know, anal, anal genital herpes, we'll talk about that and we'll treat that also. But so the approach pretty much is the same as with giving anybody a diagnosis you know, talking them through it. It's all about education. And I think that's what gives people the empowerment to be able to take care of themselves and stuff is educating them and putting all of that sort of, I won't say responsibility, because that makes it sound a little bit too heavy, but putting that your care and treatment into your own self. It's all about self-loving, helping your self-esteem, helping you work through this, because it's a combination. We work together. We're a team when it comes to working with any kind of diagnosis, no less HIV. You know, it sounds refreshing to hear that you are treating folks essentially the same, whether or not they have, they're living with HIV or not, in that um, often in my talks about healthcare and people living with HIV, it's, there's an emphasis on people first, person first, especially when dealing with health in healthcare settings with the doctor, that it's not just about coming in and going through a routine, but it's about like getting to know the person and what their needs are and, and meeting them where they are and and getting to know them on a personal level and their relationship and all, how all these factors come into play into their overall health over time. And it sounds like you're doing that with everybody. And I, I, 
it's like light bulb like this should be the standard of care for everyone no matter what Rafe, it should be. You know, for those HIV positive patients that go to a doctor and they say, hey, your T cells are fine, your viral is undetectable, I'll see you in six months, get out of there. You're so much more than your HIV infection. You know what I mean? You know, what's going on inside your head? What's going on throughout your body? What's going on in your life? You know, are, are you, is your housing stable? Is your food stable? You know, what are your family members like? What are your support system like? You know, how well do you eat? Do you exercise? There's so much more that goes into that, your own spirituality and everything. It's You're not your virus. That's just one small aspect of what you have to deal with. Hey, we all have colds or virus. Or do we go in and we you know, talk all about your HSV type one? No, no, we take that for granted, right? It's all about the things that trigger that, that cause the stress that comes out, the things you're eating that cause it to come out. There's a whole lot more than just having that diagnosis and talking about that one infection. And that's why we, 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 we deal with the individual as a whole entity. We, we talk about everything involved with every individual we sit down with. So important. Fantastic. Right love on. to hear it. Right um, well, before we dig in a little bit more into your current work, I'd love to, if you're if you're open to learn a little bit more about you personally, your history, your origin story, if you will. Oh, sure. um, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Yeah. So, you know, I'm in New York by birth. You know, I think the folks came from Brooklyn, New York, and you know, I'm Jewish. So keep that in mind. It really comes in, you know, in the way that I was brought up and everything like that. And, um, you know, we talked about stigma and discrimination. I, I went through you know, a little bit of that growing up myself as I was not a gay kid. I was raised, raised to be a heterosexual kid who was eventually going to get married and have Jewish kids, right? That's part of the Jewish upbringing there. But so I remember going back to like, I think I was seven years old when my best friend's sister called me a sissy. Well, I didn't know what a sissy was at that point. You know, I couldn't relate to that. But I said, yeah, I'm not a sissy. I can hit a baseball just as far as anybody else can at that point. But that was my first foray into that happening and everything like that. And and, and like, the, you know, the next time that happened was really when I was in college. And I actually had an experience where I was like sexually abused by my acting teacher in my first year of college. But everything in between getting to that point was always about giving back. Even in my high school fraternity, I, I got all of my fraternity brothers, my best friends involved in the Big Brothers of Greater Miami. And we were the first teen organization ever that they took in, allowing us to take care of kids at that time. And, and you know, coincidentally or not, you know, now we have Facebook and everything. I re-hooked up with my twins that I took care of when they were eight years old as I was their big brother at that time. Now with Facebook, I know, you know, we were able to reconnect and everything and talk about those years and stuff. The unfortunate part of that, Rafe, was that after we graduated, we weren't allowed to have contact with these kids anymore. And they let me know how harmful that was to them because we just disconnected. I was their big brother. You know, I was the one they looked up to and I was not allowed to have contact anymore. But the point is, it was all about giving back and, and, and you know, getting through high school. It was the same thing like that. When I got to my college years, you know, I said, you know, at that point, we didn't have HIV yet. Rafe, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I'm from the, uh, the Paleozoic era. So I decided I wanted to go to medical school and actually become a plastic surgeon. And indeed, that's what that's what I went to medical school to do. So, I, you know, I started medical school in 1979, but I'd also started coming out of the closet at that point. I came out to my parents in 1980, and that was the year we started seeing individuals with this unexplained viral infection coming into the hospital. And I remember since I was new to the community and I was hearing a lot of these, you know, were gay men coming in with these weird types of infections, even it was my, even though it was my first going into my second year of medical school, I would go up to the hospital floors, go around and talk to people. And it was really, really traumatic at that point because, you know, we didn't have anything. We didn't even know it was a virus back in those years. Remember, this thing was called gay related immunodeficiency syndrome or GRIDS. You know, you talk about labeling people like that. The initial thoughts from that went into the 4-H club. This is how we label people, 4-H club, heroin users, Haitians at that time, homosexuals, and hemophiliacs. So we had a gorgeous little term that there were four groups of people getting infected. And the bottom line back in those years was it was everybody. We just ignored Africa like it didn't even exist. This infection was going on in Africa for 100 years before we brought the attention to it by having a, an HIV, an international HIV conference on the continent in Durban, South Africa in the year 2000. So that's what got everybody to care about Africa at that time, including myself, guilty as charged, 
but that's when I wanted to open that clinic out there. So really, that's where all the humanitarian stuff came from. And it was really, you know, my mother always saying, you know, we had, so whatever you have, you need to give back in your life. You know, don't ever think it's about the material things in life. It's about you giving back. It'll all come back to you a thousandfold. You know, my mother used to use the term a kanahara, kanahara. Well, that meant just it would come back to you and, and, and you in, in, you know, a million different ways if you just give to people and, and go to sleep that, you know, well at night where you can sleep for the things that you've done. And, and that's really, really, really where I came from in doing this. So obviously when, when HIV happened and, and I, you know, did go to medical school to do plastic surgery, um, I was in my third, I think it was my, yeah, my third year of medical school when I was doing my surgery rotations and Rafe, I just couldn't deal with these egocentric surgeons throwing scalpels across the room, degrading the nurses, degrading the residents and the medical students like me. And I would have had to go through five years of general surgery with them to go to two years of plastic surgery. So I decided at that point that that was not going to be my career direction at that point. And that's when things started changing. And I started seeing a lot of people with HIV. Remember, we decided it was a, we found out it was a virus in 1983, developed the blood test in 1984. And that was all my medical school years. So that's when I decided to become an HIV specialist. I still wasn't aware of how I would give back at that point. Because remember, I was just getting through medical school and then moving from Miami to the Yale system up here and starting practice up here. I didn't think I was going to see much in the way of HIV up in Greenwich, Connecticut at that point. But lo and behold, I was like an hour outside of New York City. And my first patient came in two days after I opened my uh, my practice in Connecticut. And, you know, the rest is history after that. Did that take an emotional toll coming right out of medical school and then being in that kind of environment? Yeah, uh, you know, there were a lot of emotional tolls to go on at the whole point. And I'll, t I'll tell you sort of what happened and, and I'll give you a little example of what goes on in my life, because I do believe paths cross that things are faded for some reason. Right. So so I wasn't really happy in my internship in University of Miami because it wasn't gearing me to private practice. So, so, you know, I, I decided to call the Yale system and they said, there's a second year residence position open in, up in Waterbury Hospital through Yale. So I said, I'll take the position. I, Rafe, it was not more than three days later. They call, And I'd already told the University of Miami I wasn't coming back. They called me at Yale and said three days later that that resident who was leaving decided to stay. And I said, uh-oh, so what do I do? They said, well, we, we can't take you into the residency program, so you have to look elsewhere. I went back to Miami and said, can I come back? They said, no, we've already started searching for another position. And I freaked out. So it was literally on a Thursday. Yale calls me and says, Dr. Blick, we just got a phone call from Greenwich Hospital System. They're looking for a second year resident. Rafe, I flew up on, on Friday. I got interviewed on Saturday. And by the time I was home on Monday, I was accepted to position. It just happened like that. It was meant to be. All right. That was like one of the first big things in my life that really said, all right, you're on a path. You got to keep your eyes open and follow it. So now I finish my residency through Yale. I start practicing with a cardiologist in uh, in uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut. Well, you know, my patient, I told you, came in two days later. This guy, by the end of six months, I now had about 150 HIV patients coming to see me. And the cardiologist in Granite said, listen, my accountant said I can't afford you. My lawyer said I can't afford you. So I'm going to have to cut you loose. Now, I was leaving for a medical conference. I, I was going to be away for two weeks. And I came back essentially like not knowing what I was going to be doing, right? Two days before filing bankruptcy. OK, I had no position. I couldn't get any loans or anything. I was two days from filing bankruptcy. Went into my office in Greenwich. Comes this woman by the name of Lucy McKinney. Well, Lucy McKinney it was the widow of our former congressman, Stuart B. McKinney from Capitol Hill in Connecticut. So he was our congressman working on Capitol Hill. He had died from HIV and AIDS about a year before that, right? So she comes in a year later to get tested. And I said, Lucy, nice to meet you. I don't know her from a hole in the wall. I don't even know who Stuart B. McKinney was because I was from Florida. And I said, listen, uh, the doctor here won't even let my nurse draw your blood. This was those days, Rafe, right? Nobody knew about HIV, you know? And so I said, I can draw your blood, but I'm not even going to be working because I'm going to have to file bankruptcy, but I can get your results to you. She said, why are you filing bankruptcy? And I said, I was given my walking papers. She said, listen, I'm going to call a friend of mine and you're going to go see my friend. So this was on a, on, a, on a Wednesday. I went to see the friend on a Thursday at People's Financial Bank. The banker said the market just crashed in, you know, December 87. This is now 88. And we're really not loaning to young doctors and everything, but I'll see what I can do. Come back tomorrow. Rafe, I came back. 
and he threw in front of me papers for a $125,000 loan to open up my own office. I knew Mrs. McKinney had something to do with that. All right. And, and I really, I helped her set up the Stuart B. McKinney Foundation for Housing for Homeless with HIV. But I didn't really know who she was until I got the papers back in 1991 after I paid off the loan. This woman met me for 10 minutes, Rafe, put up a quarter of a million dollars of her assets to put up collateral for a loan for me to stay in Connecticut and do HIV. And little did I know, and I know to this day, she was the heiress for her grandfather was Standard Oil. Whoa. So uh, a corporate oil tycoon. And she was the granddaughter of that and just said, I need to help this guy out. And we got to keep him in Connecticut to help people in Connecticut. And that's how I got to stay in Connecticut. Another thing of paths crossing and everything like that. It's eerie. You know, but my life has always been like that. I can tell you a million stories like that, but there I've learned don't ever give up when you're about to crash. Keep your eyes and ears open. Something's going to come your way to help you out. And I've always lived my life for that. And I, and I, I sort of enforce that with people I take care of. Also, I let people know things may be bad. Now things may, you feel, may feel down and out, but things will always get better if you want them to. And if you keep your eyes and ears open for things going on around you, I live by that. Okay. I think those are really helpful words. A lot of, I know a lot of people who are living with HIV and follow my content um, are ultra fixated on when HIV cured. Yeah. I could be talking about the latest drugs, the latest medications, or, you know, how much we can accomplish with our lives while undetectable. And then there are a lot of people who are just so ultra fixated on that one thing and almost dismayed by the fact that every day that they're not seeing that headline come out that they're waiting for, but you know, what you're saying about, being able to to change your perspective um, could be really helpful. Yeah, and, and, but Rafe, you know, just to, just a you know, word to get out is is you know you don't want HIV if you can avoid it, and without a doubt, we know how you can avoid it. You can get on prep, you can protect yourself one hundred percent from getting it. We know if you have an HIV positive partner and they're on you know HIV medications, undetectable means untransmittable. We call that treatment as prevention. So we know those things, right? So 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 the point of that is you don't have to get HIV. But if you get HIV, it's not the worst thing in life. There are much worse things in life. Because the fact is, listen, even that guy I just told you about, 62, with a 1.8 million viral load, he was undetectable on two drug therapy, one pill in eight weeks. And all of a sudden, he started gaining his weight. His diarrhea went away. His eczema all over his back went away. It's not the worst thing. That's why people should get tested, right? Is if you don't get tested, then the worst things can happen. The best thing you can do for yourself is pay attention to these things, know that you've been at risk, and, and get tested for it, okay? If, you have, if you're HIV positive, you get on HIV medications. It's okay. But then there's all that stigma. And if you come from the African-American community or the Latino, Hispanic community, you still have to deal with the stigma and discrimination of the cultures of the people around you. So it's, it sounds easy, but, but that's why we work together. That's why we're working with you on trying to reduce this stigma and discrimination that people internally feel and also externally get stigmatized and discriminated against. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have you noticed any stark similarities or differences between uh, your experience dealing with the epidemic here in the U.S. versus, say, Zimbabwe? Oh, it's completely different. Yeah, absolutely completely different. We, we, so we, we are entitled here, Rafe. Right? There's no doubt about it. We have everything available to us. Yes, it may cost a fortune. And yes, it may seem like it costs us a fortune so we can take care of the rest of the world. We'll, we'll keep that conversation for another day. But, but in Africa, they don't have all the things we have. Remember, they didn't even have anybody caring about them for the first 100 years of yeah. this epidemic. And I meant to ask you about that, too. Sorry to interrupt. But yeah, is that is that a literal number? 100 years? Yes. So we, I've, we, this is the first time that I've ever heard that. Yep. You can go back and they now have, you know, stories and they even have samples of this infection being in people in Africa in the 1800s, in the 1890s specifically. It been, didn't become an epidemic back then, but once you a, a monkey virus gets introduced into the human genome and everything, it doesn't, it's not very efficient at that point. It takes a lot of generations for it to adapt to us and to adapt and to evolve within us for it to become a human 
immunodeficiency virus, which is what HIV is. So it evolved, it started back in the 1800s and it took those years to evolve, but it really exploded once it started becoming a, a, a part of our immune systems and being sexually transmitted. It wasn't at first. Mm. So yes. by virtue of the fact that we didn't give attention to it and didn't address it when it was not as evolved, yeah, well, we I mean, it, and honestly, because it really started exploding probably in the 40s and 50s. And and even the first cases in the United States, there was, um, I think, a case going back to Chicago in the 1950s of an intravenous drug user at that point was the first one, in hindsight, known to have HIV here in this country. And as you know, it exploded here after the 70s into the 80s. So the bottom line is we probably couldn't have done much about it back then. We didn't have the technology to develop these kind of antiviral agents that we have now. Um, um, there's always the power of positive thinking. Listen, that's what we did from 1987 until 1990 in our support groups, because, you know, I was never going to use AZT as a single therapy to treat a virus. I, we learned that from tuberculosis. You needed three drugs. So when we started treating, we always did two drug therapy. But the bottom line is there's probably not much we could have done about it at that point, except awareness and education and make people aware if we knew that at that point this was sexually transmitted, you know? But, but, you know, I, I always deal with sort of history as it happens. You can't really look back. You can learn lessons by looking back, but you really can't change the past. You can only change the present and the future. Well, speaking of learning from the past, um, we recently had to deal with the COVID pandemic, obviously. And there are sometimes comparisons made to uh, the response to the HIV epidemic and how we handled both. And the there's so much distrust that has come out of the COVID pandemic uh, because of the way that health officials handled it, politicians handled it, the medical community, as far as being open and honest and transparent about things. Um, and I've noticed that, I mean, clearly there's a, a way more conspiracy theories now. There's all these, you know, podcast experts who are suddenly health experts and are just sp spreading tons of crazy stories and conspiracy theories. And I've noticed personally, I'm curious if you have, a resurgence and an increase of HIV aid denialism. Yes, yes. So first of all, public health should never be political health, okay? So they should be separate and they shouldn't even intersect and they should never be, but that's, that's the way it should be. It's not the way it is in reality. So this became completely politicized with, with COVID at that point. And, and, and the same thing with the vaccines, Rafe. Oh, my God. What, what did we call it? Uh, uh, what, what did Trump call it? The campaign is Operation uh, it was something after Star Trek. I forgot. I blocked it out. But these vaccines have been in development for 17 years. These were not like created in that one year and put into, you know, into people without any kind of research. We knew the safety and efficacy of this stuff because there were two COVID pandemics uh, that, that didn't explode the way this did prior to this. You know, people forget about SARS. Well, that's when these vaccines started to be developed. They forget about MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. That was another COVID type virus. It just didn't explode. It, it settled in. It just didn't have the efficiency that this one did. But so the time when this virus happened, and, and, and it exploded at that point, we had a vaccine ready to go. So we didn't need to go through all those phases again to prove it was safe you know, and effective. We knew it was safe and effective against these viruses. It was just a matter of getting it into, into trials to show that it worked. That was it. And you know, so all these conspiracy theories and everything, I, I don't buy into them. You know, there's science behind it. There are facts behind it. You don't want to believe science and facts. That's your problem. But don't start trying to convince other people that you don't want to believe in these things when, you know, I'm a scientist. I've done research since 1990. You need science to develop these things. You need facts to develop these things. These studies are really done. They're strict. They're what we call double blinded, placebo controlled trials, which means nobody knows what they're getting until something really comes out of it. They're really rigid studies. You can make all the conspiracy theories in the world about it. I, I don't care. You want to, you want to argue about the origin origins of COVID, we can get into that one too. And you can have a million theories about that. But when it came to the vaccines and treatment, this is science, okay? It, it, it's, it, it's developed to help people. And sure enough, it saved millions of people. Millions of, a million people died as a result of all the misinformation and disinformation being spread out there. And, and for those who spread that information, do you take that responsibility for all the people that died as a result of this? No, I'm sure you don't. You just keep spreading disinformation. I deal in science, I deal in facts. And, and listen, when science is wrong, we got to admit it. When the facts are wrong and they've changed, 
listen, things evolve. We got to change our science. We got to change our thinking. But that's the way things go. You know, I, I don't buy into all this conspiracy theory, you know, you know, crap. You know, once again, I, I don't know if we're like a cable and I can say, you know, bullshit on this, but it yeah. is bullshit. OK, it really is. And, and, and I don't buy into these things. And I, I wish we could stop that spread of disinformation. But, you know, with social media these days, it's really hard to do that. Well, so and I think it's and just like God. stigma. It's 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 one of those things where if you just try to ignore it and not address it, it's going to grow. And usually it grows on the margins where it's kind of like, okay, well, it's just a few like crazies with tinfoil hats on. And right. before you know it, know, know it, it's on your doorstep, it's in your neighbor's you know, living room. And you're like, wow, this has gotten out of control. What happened? Right, right, right. Yours and my job is to get the education out there and get the facts out there. You know, people yeah. can take it or leave it. You know, but I think if we do a good job in trying to convey the information and we don't ram it into people's, you know, brains and say, you got to do this, you know, when somebody comes in and I make a suggestion about prep, yeah, nah, maybe. OK, so just I want you to go home and think about it. Think about and it. Maybe you want to read a little bit about it. Next time you come in, we can talk about it a little bit more. And, and you know, people just need time to be able to develop that trust and to really then say, make an informed decision. They may come in and say no immediately because of things they've read on the Internet. But if you plant the seed and you just put a little bit of water in there and you allow the seed to, you know, eventually grow, a, you know, a little flower out of it, you know, people people do come around. So I just think it can't be a, you know, a hard sell, you know, it's like, you got to get tested for HIV. No, 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 no. Listen, I recommend you do. You never, you know, things that you've talked about could have put you at risk in the past. If you're not ready today, that's okay. You haven't tested for the last few years. We'll talk about it when you come back next time. There are just ways to go about it that are human ways to go about it, where you're sensitive to people's needs and you're empathetic to their needs. And then you can work with people a whole lot better that way. And I'm hoping with Stigma Warriors, we can develop that kind of approach to talking about HIV and PrEP, especially for those who have never been tested in and, and don't envision themselves at risk for HIV, right? Self-identified yeah. risk. Okay, I'm, I'm pulling the ship into the harbor a little slowly here. Um, but I do want to talk about youth. You work with youth. Um, yes. I noticed that I noticed an article I saw where you're offering a scholarship to some um, youth advocates. Fantastic. What's your read on the knowledge of youth when it comes to HIV, when it comes to uh, their sex lives and sexual health? Yeah. So I, I'm getting the impression now that that our youth think HIV is no big deal. Oh, you only need to take one pill once a day. What's the big deal? Well, first of all, that one pill once a day costs $30,000 a year. Do you have insurance for that? OK, so that's the first thing. Second, and I don't want people to downplay HIV because if you don't take care of yourself, it's not HIV that's going to get you. It's all the other what we call comorbidities associated with HIV. They're going to get you. And you don't have a clue about that at this point because you live and I did, too, for here and now. OK, what are we doing tonight? You know, what are we doing tomorrow night? But you're not thinking about, oh, if I get HIV, I'm now three times increased risk from dying from a heart attack or stroke, not unlike being a cigarette smoker. And if I'm HIV positive and I smoke cigarettes, I'm at six times risk for developing a heart attack or a stroke and dying from that. Or non-AIDS related cancers, which are now significant when it comes to being HIV positive. So the bottom line is you don't have to suffer through those things if you come to an office or a practice like ours, because we screen for everything like that. You know, they, they, there was even one study that said people HIV positive even live longer than the, the natural lifespan of the American population. Why would that be? Well, if it was true, um, it's because there's more attention being paid to your medical self or everything about you. If you're coming in regularly and we can screen for heart disease and we can do prevention for heart disease, then maybe you don't have to worry about those things. If we can do early screens for cancer, we can nip those things before you have a cancer spread throughout all your body and you're going to die early as a result of it. So I don't want to say HIV is no big deal the way they're saying it's no big deal anymore. It is one pill once a day or shot, you know, two sets, uh, two shots every eight weeks, and then it'll become hopefully your shots every six months. But but it really is a big deal. You have to live with it for the rest of your life. Do you really want to deal with the long term ramifications of getting HIV, especially in the year 2024, when you can avoid it and prevent getting it? 
Okay. That's the way I look at it. So uh, listen, you know, I was 20, 20 years old, 18 years old, and I wasn't thinking about that. For me, you know, a guy like my, you know, in my age was like, you know, they're dead and buried at that point. You don't think about a 60 year old. You're thinking about 18 and 20 and 21, right? So I, I realize that we don't think towards the future and that may not be unique to this generation. It may be unique to youth in general, but that's my feeling about youth and HIV is they don't take it seriously anymore. And they may not have gotten education about it going through schools and certainly high school um, and maybe even in college. And we should be on the college campuses doing HIV testing events, talking about prep and, and you know, and, and teaching these things because I don't think they got that education. That's going to be a big part of Stigma Warriors is going to the universities and colleges and trying to create that awareness together. Great. That's awesome. And and I don't want those of, of you living with HIV to suddenly get scared by hearing Dr. Blick rattle off all these comorbidities. There There's still so much that's in our control, like you were alluding to as well. I mean, it's we're just we're really just starting our work on aging with HIV and all the things that we can do to allay these comorbidities like statins right. with CBD yes. and, and how much impact our lifestyle has and our diet and our fitness, all of it. And tell, you know, yes, all your listeners should know, have faith that, you know, what we know works in the general population is always going to be studied to see if it works the same in the HIV population. You just mentioned one of those things, and that's statins. We've always known, yeah, statins were approved to lower cholesterol, right? But that never explained how they prevented heart attack and stroke. So they learn that statins prevent heart attack and stroke by reducing inflammation in the blood vessels. That was significant. Well, HIV is, a, is an infection of chronic inflammation. So it's not a shock that people with HIV are at three times at risk, you know, three times higher risk of getting heart attacks and strokes. But statins reduce that risk by one third. And the reprieve study was just public, was just released at the end of August to show that statins work the same in HIV positive people as they do in you, in myself. And I've been on statins now for 25 years for that prevention too. And I believe everybody HIV positive should be on a statin. And if you're not, ask your doctor about them because statins are proven in HIV positive people to prevent, to reduce risk for heart attack and stroke. Is there an age threshold that you would recommend that? Uh, it, it also depends on uh, family history and other things that are going on. So if you also have a cigarette smoker and you have high blood pressure or, or you're diabetic, yes, we'll start earlier than later. I started my stat when I was at 45 years old. That's pretty standard, you know, with a little history of cardiovascular disease in my family. And that's all I really had, um, except my triglycerides were also elevated. So I started at 45 and have been on them essentially for over 25 years at this point. I started at 44, actually. So so I, I wouldn't say, but certainly by 50 years old, um, you can you can check, you can get started. There's a blood test called a highly sensitive C-reactive protein that any doctor can order. And if that test is over two, certainly if it's over three, that means there's inflammation going on inside the coronary arteries and you can start on a statin immediately to reduce that inflammation and get that protective benefit. So not Great. a specific That's... age, but it also depends on everything about the individual. But yeah, that sparks that can spark a great conversation with individuals with their doctors about that. Yes, I was gonna mention anal carcinoma. We think we forget about HPV, Rafe, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of doctors won't even screen for HPV, but the bottom line is we know that human papilloma virus, the, the virus that can cause genital and anal warts, you may not see any genital and anal warts, but you may still have it. So an annual pap smear, especially for, for gay men, bisexual men, transgender women, um, but also for heterosexual women. Because if you had an abnormal pap smear, or cervical pap smear, that HPV can migrate to the anus and cause anal cancer, even in heterosexual cisgender women. The bottom line is everybody should have an anal pap smear done once a year, once every two years. If you're positive for HPV, we determine if it's a high risk strain that can cause cancer. And then we do some what we call cytology to see if it's changed any of the linings of the cells in the anus, and you can prevent anal cancer that way. There's another comorbidity that we could easily go about and test for and prevent. You know, I would love to do a separate video with you just on general guidelines for those of us living and aging with HIV to have conversations with our doctor about, because I don't know, Absolutely. there's no formal, you know, structure for dealing with this. It's true. One, one of the least recognized things, and for me, it's well recognized because we even did a study and published it is two thirds of HIV positive men 
and cisgender women. Well, cisgender women are on hormonal therapy, so let's not talk about that at that point. But two thirds of HIV positive or gay or bisexual men will have low testosterone as a result of having HIV infection. Most doctors will only check the total testosterone. That's the least important marker. And if you just check that, you're going to miss 60% of the low testosterone diagnoses. So, you know, if you're HIV positive, have your free testosterone and or your bioavailable testosterone checked by your doctor. And you may find out that's your cause for fatigue. 94% of people with low testosterone, the first thing they'll complain about is fatigue. The last thing they'll complain about is erectile dysfunction or reduced libido. There's a million things associated with that that we can talk about for guidelines. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the other one, I'm just going to throw this out there. I saw um, at Croy, there was a, a study that was shared uh, about the effect of semaglutide on the liver. Being yes. Those living HIV. Yes. Yes. So, so mm -hmm. semiglutide, you know, everybody knows that. Semiglutide, is that what it is? Semiglutide is known as <laughs> Ozembic, right? We know all the commercials yeah. for it. And, and this is a very, very interesting thing, uh, Rafe, because we now know that about 40 to 45% of the Americans suffer from what we used to call non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now we don't want to say it's alcoholic related. So we say metabolic associated fatty liver disease. The bottom line is people with HIV, over 60% of them, can have fatty liver disease. Fatty liver disease can lead to heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure, and so on and so forth, right? So the reason we're bringing up semiglutide is these are medications that were originally prescribed for diabetics, right? And, and, and we knew that diabetics got a 20% reduction in risk for heart attack and stroke for, from, with uh, ozempic, semiglutides. But then we realized they were losing weight. So they designed a completely different study with no diabetics allowed just to see people that were overweight and obese to see what this did for obesity, right? And sure enough, Rafe, the people non-diabetic got the same exact 20% reduction in risk for heart attack and stroke as diabetics did. It was not about controlling the diabetes. All along, it was all about the weight loss. Now, why is this important? Because these drugs are not only helping people reduce their weight, this is not cosmetic, this is medical now, okay? So, so not only are you reducing your weight, which reduces all the ramifications of having obesity, but it's also controlling blood pressure, where you can get off your blood pressure meds. And now back to what you brought up is it's reducing fatty liver disease in HIV positive individuals. So there's, there's something called lipodystrophy that people with HIV can get. When we, when we see fat accumulation around the belly, we call it HIV lipohypertrophy. These drugs seem to work on that. They're not indicated for that yet. Keep that in mind. But we're now seeing evidence how these quote unquote diabetic drugs, which are now going to be weight loss drugs these year, will really help for long-term ramifications of a lot of those comorbidities we were talking about with HIV, including fatty liver disease. Fantastic. You, you've accomplished a, a ton as like an entrepreneur in launching organizations, benefiting the LGBTQ communities and HIV communities. Um, I know this is an unfair question because I'm ask, asking a lot of you in a very brief amount of time, but how? How do you do it? How do you create? How do you launch and develop these kinds of projects uh, for budding advocates and activists who have that you know, burning desire inside them to do something impactful like that? Do you have any advice? Yeah. First of all, you just said the first thing there is you got to have a burning desire. And that is, like I said, maybe that was put in me by my folks, but I've always had that burning desire to help out and do something about it. And, and at that point, once you have that burning desire, it's a matter of really following your heart. You may not find it on the first path you get on. But it, like I said it earlier in the interview, you know, if you keep your eyes and ears open, it's out there waiting for you. It's meant to be if that's the way it's going to be, but you've got to keep your eyes and ears open. When you hit the skids and you're down and out, do not, yes, you're going to be depressed. Of course, you're going to think that this is the end of it. But the bottom line is the next thing is going to happen. You're going to come right back up after that. Stay focused, follow your dreams, follow your heart. It's doable. OK, I didn't think about this when I was in high school or college. It just sort of happened to me because I was raised that way to sort of go and follow my heart and find out what my direction is going to be. you got to believe in yourself. And that's where we can help people. you got to have self-esteem to do that also. You know, and we have to help people with their self-esteem and self-image and their self-loving -lo and get them out of their self-loathing. Right. Um, but it's out there for you. Like I didn't plan to, to, you know, to run nonprofits or anything like that. I did 
did plan to be a plastic surgeon. That's about as far as I can say. I even get to do plastic surgery now with my HIV positive patients who have lost fat in their face. So at least I get to do a little bit of both worlds at this point. But point being is, you know, listen to your heart, believe in yourself, love yourself, or get to the point where you can love yourself. It's out there for you. And even if you don't want to be an entrepreneur, that's going to help you be successful in whatever you do in your life. It's so true. When people ask me how I became an advocate to where I am today, I'm like a long series of yeses to whatever popped up that was in alignment with what I care about, with what I want to do, even if it was different than what I had planned for myself, but on the same trajectory, I would say yes and pivot and try it. You can always cut things out along the way if they're not working for you. And it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to follow a path that really wasn't right for you. You'll find out the next path after that. Everything's okay. You know, and yes, you're entitled to feel down and out for what you've done, but don't stay like that too long because the next thing's waiting for you if that wasn't the right path or if things happen. And, you know, I don't know how much time we have left, but just one more thing I want to interject. I was, I was in, I was already working as an HIV specialist um, in Greenwich Hospital in Greenwich, Connecticut, you know, it's sort of like Orange County, right? And, and all of a sudden, I had my privileges summarily suspended to admit patients to the hospital. Um, prior to that, I was asked to come into the president's office of the hospital. And I was basically asked, was I going to be taking care of inner city blacks from Bridgeport at this hospital? Dr. Blick, we don't want to be known as an AIDS treatment center. The writing was on the wall at that point, okay? So they took away my privileges, Rafe. I had 14 people at a time in the hospital. That was my revenue. That was my income. And now I, I didn't have that. So, you know, my tail goes between my legs. I'm thinking, should I shut down and move back to Miami where I came from and everything? And, and you know, I decided to pick up the phone and, and paths crossed. And I got the, the chairman of the Connecticut Civil Liberties Union, who was part of the ACLU, argued in front of the Supreme Court. And we went to Greenwich Hospital and they allowed me only one hearing a, a a month, one hearing a month for two hours. It took 12 months and, and we really weren't making progress on getting my privileges back. But the Lambda Legal Defense said, we're willing to come to your rescue and we're willing to file a lawsuit. One million people HIV positive in the United States versus Greenwich Hospital at that point. And that would have been huge because I was doing all this research for new experimental therapies and people were flying in from all parts of the United States. So it could have been that kind of lawsuit. And they settled with me. But instead of like getting depressed, saying, okay, I'm on the wrong path, going back on the plane, getting back to Miami, I decided to fight it. That was actually my awareness to always look over your shoulder, be aware, and don't worry. You know, even if you're doing something cutting edge and on the fringes and things like that, I was doing passive immunotherapy. Like if you remember that for COVID, I was doing that for HIV to prevent people from dying from AIDS-related infections. Well, the bottom line is they didn't want that at this hospital. The, 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 the resolution is I won the lawsuit. I got a nice settlement, I got a specialist position, and I never looked back after that. It's how I became a patient advocate after that is le learning to advocate for yourself, knowing that you're also advocating for everybody you take care of. It's just things happen when they're about to happen. You can't force them. Yeah, that's such a great right? story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what does Gary Blick do when he, at the end of the day, taking off his tie, his shoes, what, what do you do to unwind? What are your hobbies? What do you do to recharge? Yeah. So, so for, you know, so number one, I go home to my husband, you know, we've been married six years now. Uh, Easter Sunday is our eighth year from when we met. I come home to our three Labrador retrievers. So we raise Labrador retrievers together. We've got, you know, mother, father, and son at the house right now. And we'll probably do a fourth at that point. Um, my upbringing was uh, my very first uh, record album when we had records when my grandmother bought me a guitar and bought me introducing the Beatles not even meet the Beatles it wasn't out yet so the Beatles for me is my safe zone it is my safe space you'll come into my office you'll hear Beatle music playing in the background I couldn't even tell you what's playing at that point because it's just keeps me calm, it keeps me mellow, and, and that's it. And then what we love to do is we love to travel. You know, it wouldn't be unusual to find us down at like the Island House in, in Key West, you know, just relaxing, getting some sunshine, and just doing that kind of stuff. We love to travel, we love to see the world, and, uh, and if we're home, it's just being together and going out to a movie, going out to dinner, and enjoying all those kind of things. Yeah, that's what keeps me sober. It keeps me sober and sane. Is there anything you'd like to promote before we head out? 
Yeah. Listen, I, I really want to talk about the stigma warriors just for one second, because this is really a critical campaign. And, and what we really need, Rafe, is young influencers like yourself. One of the reasons why we partnered with the Elton John AIDS Foundation, which was an incredible event. You are so right, Rafe. They raised $10.8 million in one night. It's just amazing that they can do that. And yes, I would love to have Elton and David, uh, David Furness as, as stigma warriors and let them tell their story of stigma that they've gone through in their lives, be it LGBT uh, stigma. Elton used to refer to me, uh, some of the, his friends that were HIV positive back in the 80s and 90s. So he can even probably talk about HIV stigma and PrEP stigma and things like that. But more importantly, and, and I thought about this when I saw Elton and, and Lil Nas X on the Grubhub commercials, we really need somebody like Lil, Lil Nas X to be able to speak to the inner city black and brown kids and maybe even do one event with us where we can Film it, get his word on stigma discrimination, being a young, gay, black, you know, performer, entertainer, and, and his take on stigma in the community, as well as maybe he knows about HIV stigma or PrEP stigma, or maybe he's even taking PrEP himself, right? We really need those kind of young influencers and yourself to be able to get the word to these communities. Rafe, we've got to cut these 37,000 infections every year down to at least half of that, you know, and, and even even less than that, if we're going to end global HIV by 2030. So Stigma Warriors campaign, you'll see a lot more of this. We want to start getting people really involved with us. We'll get testing events out there. We'll get the word out to social media. And we rely on, on yourself to help us out with that too, Rafe. You are a brilliant Stigma Warrior. Thank you for helping us too. Well, and Gary, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with me. This has been eye-opening to say the least. And I'd love to have you back on the channel um, when the opportunity presents itself to really dig into s some of these things that we, again, being advocates for ourselves and our own health can do in our relationship with our doctor to prepare as we continue to live and thrive with HIV. Rafe, I admire you. I admire the work you do. It is critical to everything that's getting done out there. And I would love to come back and spend another hour with you. I'd love to do that. You just let me know when. Done. Everyone okay. at home, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to share your thoughts, comments, and questions down below. Gary, a huge thank you to you for being so gracious with your time. Everyone at home, thank you so much for watching. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, uh, hit the bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out, and please share this with anyone who you think might find value in this content, that those are the best ways that you can help support me and my channel. Until next time, cheers. Cheers.